Hi everyone, and welcome into the Rochester Press Box. It's nice to have you. I'm Bill Pucko, joined by the guys as usual. Tariq Spence, how are you doing? Really good. Happy holidays to all those that are uh, watching the show for today. Alrighty. Seasonal, you got a greeting for us? Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> We're in number 14. Here. Well, yeah, I finally get to uh, enjoy fully Frank Reich now that he is not the coach of a team that had the potential to knock the Bills out of the playoffs at least the last two seasons, not this year anymore. But, hey, <laughs> sorry, Frank. Got to have welcome a job back. for that. Welcome back, buddy. <laughs> yeah, consensus is he'll get another one. I th seem, they seem to think, despite how badly things went for him in Indianapolis, that he's still a good coach. I blame roster management, not the coaching, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know, let's talk about the Arizona Cardinals right off the top. The funny thing, you know, I'm thinking about this, is it's like, what's less interesting than the Arizona Cardinals? But I look at them, and a year ago, they won their first eight games out of the gate. They're 8-0, power rankings. They got everything going for them, a dynamic young quarterback. And a year later, it's crap. I mean, they have more issues than anybody in the league. And I keep thinking, cautionary tale? I mean, you know, the worst case scenario. Can this kind of thing happen in Buffalo? Well, it's uh, well, no, no, no. Let, let, me, let me get that jinx away from Buffalo right now for Duffy's sake. But, but can, it, can it be destroyed that quickly? Remember, they got rid of Josh Rosen and went with Kyler Murray. It worked out great. It looked like it was going to be a fantastic team. Yep, yep. J.J. Watt joins the team. You got Hopkins in a trade. All these things started lining up. And then became... The big contract discussion. Then became the homework for the quarterback and Murray. Then one one of your big wide receivers isn't there. Then JJ Watt isn't playing. And then it became like this this roller coaster disaster. I can't see why you wouldn't even consider blowing it back up again and starting from so scratch. But, but, but where in that scenario could they have halted it? Uh, Maybe not given that big contract? Well, no, I, I think it goes way back further. And I think the things that you named as positives were actually why the Cardinals are in this position they're in right now. They just went for the sexiest stuff they could find. They hire Cliff Kingsbury, who's never been successful. Like, as much as he's a name, he doesn't win. If you've seen that in the NFL towards the end of each season, he's 1-12 in his last 13 home games. Do you know that? Kyler Murray, you took a first-round quarterback that you bail on after a season and go get Kyler Murray. That's a massive red flag. You picked up DeAndre Hopkins. Great trade, but why didn't the Texans want him there anymore? Oh, look what happened a couple of things. Hollywood Brown, same situation. J.J. Watt is washed up and injury-prone, and you went and got that. All because it made you sound good. To me, the entire Cardinals franchise the last three years has been all flash, no substance. So to answer the question that you brought up a second ago, the Bills have been the exact opposite. For the most part, they've built from the inside out. You bring the Stephon Diggs trade to move things forward a little bit, but there's depth, there's plan, there's quality coaching. And I think the reason they go 8-0 last year and collapse after, when you have talent, you can win games. You can just beat teams straight up. But teams figure out how to beat you. It's teams that surge towards the end of the season that have good coaching. And you've seen the Bills the last two, hopefully this year again, Go on crazy win streaks into deep playoff runs. Let me let me throw in another comparison. The coaching and quarterback dynamic. If you've noticed, the coaching quarterback dynamic is so big. Kingsbury and Murray. So oftentimes but seems that a little was bit supposed bit. to be the strength that he had coached him in college. But you know what's interesting? What happens from college on to the pros? Money, all these the ego, all these different flash in the pan things that happen that, that that Duffy was talking about. The other thing too is is the fact that there is this sort of feeling of in interviews or post game, the comments don't linger on. Tell me something, Josh Allen, that says that have had comments linger on the next day, two days, three days later. Maybe there's a problem here. We don't feel about that. He seems to be getting along, whether it was Dable, whether it's Dorsey, whether it's the, uh, McDermott. He seems to get along very well and goes with the team, and he got the bag. Look, three letters he just brought up is the problem with this team. Ego. EGO, it's ego, right? Like the quarterback wants to be the guy. The coach wants to be the guy. The defensive end you bring in wants to be the guy. The wide receiver wants to be the guy. The Bills have done a really good job of not bringing in ego issues, whereas the Cardinals did the exact opposite. you got talented players, but, you know, five players don't win you a football game. 22 of them do. But it, was this just, was it luck? Yeah, I mean, I mean, luck is an interesting word. Maybe you can call it luck. I think that when you have a little bit of success, it's easy to put your ego aside because everybody's getting their credit when things are going well. It's when the ship hits rough seas and people start to point fingers outside the franchise, which causes fingers to be pointed inside the franchise, i.e. the quarterback doesn't study enough, i.e. the head coach is all about what he looks like, not about actually coaching the game, i.e. J.J. Watt's busy videotaping himself working out instead of actually going and doing what he's supposed to be doing. That's when problems show up. I will also add in that there's, you can go all in a little too early. And I think what W's point about the Bills is that they kind of built this foundation of a defense over time. They built this offense over time, getting weapons over time. They got Cole Beasley back. It, 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 it's almost as if it's 
attracting more players as opposed to just getting what you can on the open market and let's, okay, let's just go for the Super Bowl because we think we can get there. And here's the thing. I mean, if you want a comparison of a franchise that has done exactly what the Cardinals did and it blew up in their face, the Cleveland Browns for the last three years, right? And even this year with Deshaun Wat- uh, uh, Deshaun Watson. Quarterback's got an ego. Two wide receivers have an ego. Defensive end has an ego. Coach has an I ego. Still, I still look at these profiles, and it's like, you know, you're Buffalo, it's so Cleveland, you know, Arizona. It's like, God, you know, what's to stop it? I don't it, know. Scare, it scares me. It, and because to use your analogy about a ship in rough seas, mm-hmm. I don't think this particular Bills team has had that yet. How there, will they react? It's, it, there is a thin line between I'm going to prove everybody wrong, I'm going to prove everybody wrong, and then I'm going to show everybody and prove everything wrong. When he brought up Cleveland, I thought of Baker Mayfield. What? I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to prove everybody wrong. Didn't work out. Disaster. Third team in, what, two years, if that. And then the same sort of thing with Kyler Murray. I hope he doesn't go in that net. He's a natural throw of the ball. He's a talented player. But... The team concept, is he all in with the rest of the team like these other successful quarterbacks? And going back to the Bills analogy, I would make the argument they have hit the rough seas. They lost two in a row this season. They lost two in a row the season before. They got blown out at home by the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, it's the ability. That's not the same universe as what happened to Cleveland, Arizona. But I would disagree. I would say, how do you know that those first two losses aren't what kickstarted this complete decline of what's going on, right? If you can handle a loss, key loss, two, three in a row, and right the ship, you're fine. Who knows if those first two losses in Arizona isn't what set the fuse that blew the bomb up. This is the Rochester Press Box. Buffalo Bills are next. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us here on the Rochester Press Box. Our Buffalo Bill segment is brought to you by Ralph Honda. For three generations, is celebrating 50 years as New York's first and oldest Honda dealer. Visit Ralph Honda today and find out how we do Honda right at ralphhonda.com. So, uh, Josh Allen had a, a, an interesting press conference conversation with uh, Jerry Sullivan mm-hmm. at a uh, you know, pu- public, public forum with, with the press, the whole bit. And, and Jerry makes a flat statement saying, I don't think the offense is good enough to win the Super Bowl. To which Josh says, okay. What are the Pretty way, cool, right? Well, yeah, I mean, but what are, like, it's funny. Like, I mean, look, I've never, first of all, heard a reporter just lay out a statement like that and expect an athlete to, to respond. So that's what's so funny about it. I mean, look, Jerry Sullivan's had a week on his own. <laughs> but, um, I mean, that's so the, we can talk about that. But that's the only response you can give because it wasn't a question. And, like, I saw it. And, look, man, I'm not going to fault any reporter for making any statement at a press conference, right? Like, that's what these are for. Like, you're supposed to ask the question. But... What, yes, a question. But what response did you expect? I think Josh handled it perfectly. Yeah. I think that he was trying to be trying to goad him a little bit, and the fact that Josh gave him no ammunition completely killed the story. Whatever was trying to be established, the narrative pushed by Jerry Sullivan in this case. Well, I, you, the funny part about that is, is the answer in and of itself. What answer would you would like to give? Oh, I'm keeping receipts, or like all these are the different quotes that have been have come back to bite people in the end. They wish they hadn't said. Here's a line that he comes back and says, like, "Okay, I can see a shirt of that." From now on, when you're going to the Super Bowl, yeah. oh, okay. Like, okay. okay. A lot of guys do that. It's like confrontational journalism. You, you'll do something like that, trying to elicit a, a response that's going to get national track. Yeah, but there was, there, there was no question this wasn't one of those sort of bait thing. I don't know if you wanted to trend. I don't know what this was. This kind of gotcha moment as you're talking about. There was no question in there in, in a sense of where you're going to, do you feel this offense is ready now to go to a Super Bowl? That's a question, mm-hmm. as opposed to just making a statement that you now have to respond to. But that's where we are in this sort of gotcha, I want to say what this is. Is uh, make myself sort of the story as opposed to Josh Allen's story. Josh Allen's answer is perfect and leadership. And but here's the thing, man. I like take Jerry Sullivan out of it. I don't mind goading journalism at a press conference. As a card carrying member of the International Loud, Loud Mouths of America, like that's fine. Like this is supposed to be entertaining. All of this is a child's game. Like <laughs> I'm fine with emotion and anger and you know back and forth between a reporter. Like it doesn't hurt anybody. But to Tariq's point, he's right. Like Josh Allen is a seasoned leader professional to not take that bait, look him in the face, and then in just two letters, completely turn it back on the reporter and make him look like a complete idiot. It's funny you say that. A lot of it maybe is because it's Josh's appearance. I still think of him as a kid. Yeah. Well, he he isn't because, again, in NFL years and the, the amount of years you get in a career in the NFL, 
to to his point, he's yeah. a seasoned veteran now. Yeah, but I, I, you know, it goes to the training of what these guys will say and what the what's caught on video. This is after a game. This is an emotional moment. Guys are you know going through the now. If you win, you lose. You might get a different answer. Mm-hmm. You might get a different answer from Josh. But in that moment, he handled it well. The other thing I find this to be interesting about Buffalo as we get ready and uh, go to the end of the season. I will give Duffy's props. He was absolutely right. Don't worry about the Jets. Don't worry about New England. Don't <laughs> worry about. It. I get it all. All, the, all all of those different things are going forward. If you will just admit. He likes the Bills running game. Well, of course, I like the running game. Your argument was you need a running game. You do. You don't need a running game. Yes, you do. They just beat one of the best defenses in the NFL with Josh Allen as their leading rusher, and their James Cook had four rushes for six yards. Good luck with that in the playoffs. Okay. What was your reaction? I signed Cole Beasley. I mean, did that did that uh, amount to a blip on the radar? I find it interesting just based on what Cole Beasley said after he had left the franchise. Like he was liking tweets yeah. that people, you know, the franchise has been different. So the, there is a story, and I don't know how true this is. It was reported by a new station in Buffalo that it was Josh Allen that asked for both John Brown and Cole Beasley back as security blankets, and the front office went to the players and asked each one of them individually, "Would you be okay with Cole wow. Beasley back in the room?" And nobody said no. So. You want to well, win? I like that the organization isn't too proud that a guy that burned some bridges on his way out, oh, yeah. they say, hey, look, for the better good, you know, we'll still be willing to do this. If Odell Beckham Jr. was healthy, I don't think this would be happening. So you're right. I mean, it does show a piece of humility. However, it's the absolute last case scenario because you went and signed John Brown first. I was surprised. I mean, I get the Odell Beckham thing not to get him. I get all that. He kind of outpriced himself. But uh, the Beasley thing, that was a lot of, uh, you, he probably went to Stephon Diggs as well said, hey, do you mind this guy back in the locker room? Our Buffalo Bill segment is brought to you by Ralph Honda. Like it or not, is next. Here's the Press Box trivia question brought to you by Market View Liquor, where exceptional customer service meets an extensive selection. Jefferson Road at 390. I brought you many. Today I'm bringing you more food finds in Boston's North End. Mike O'Brien, your getaway guy. Come along for the ride. It's my latest look for the getaway guy on Facebook. Here's a Press Box trivia answer brought to you by Market View Liquor, where exceptional customer service meets an extensive selection. Jefferson Road at 390. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us here on the Rochester Press Box. Our Like It or Not segment is brought to you by Sport Clips, where the MVP experience is better than ever. Sport Clips, the pros in men's hair, no appointment needed. Stop by a Rochester location today. Tariq, like it or not, uh, hey, your New York Giants are fading. Yeah, yeah, and I don't like it. Uh, I do understand this is the nature of the team. And listen, I, I love Brian Dable. I love him as a head coach. I love GM. I love, shit. I love everything about it. But I think we know now what I've been talking about for the last three years. Daniel Jones is not the quarterback. He is a quarterback. He is an NFL quarterback. We might have to keep him for another year till we find our quarterback, but we're not complete. And if Saquon Barkley cannot run the ball, we can't control the time. If we can't control the time, we're allowing him to pass. If he can't pass and hit his receivers, even though they're not great, they can't win the game. So that's too much on the defense. I love him, but I'll play this all the way through to the end, baby, until we're eliminated. Yeah, who would have thought if this deep into the season, they'd be relevant at all. Absolutely. Great Christmas gift. <laughs> hey, like it or not, it, this episode falls under the the issue of maybe political correctness, but the Buffalo Sabres have stopped their sponsored segment of Collision of the Week. Okay, so I see it from two ways. If you want to talk about political correctness not looking bad, I understand it. I mean, if you follow hockey at all, you understand there's been several issues with players' mental health and suicides, mostly from guys that were fighting for years and years and years. I mean, CTE and hockey went from 10 years ago, oh, it doesn't exist in hockey, to now they're making legitimate strides. Now, I don't know if that's because they really feel that way or because they know perception is reality and they want people to stay. The other part of it is, I mean, look, Anybody that watches hockey know the game is, knows now the game is faster, it's smoother, there's less contact, more skill. So it was funny, like you would watch like the collision of the game and it would be just two guys bumping shoulders because nobody <laughs> can get a body on anybody else because everybody's so good now. So yeah, I understand that there are people that are like, oh, how do you take this out of the game? But it naturally took itself out of the game. Would a sponsor want to pay for a guy doing this as the collision of the game? Depends how you react to it. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you react like that, I'll pay every week, Bill. But. So, you know, one word answer. Is, is the game better now? Yes. 
Very good. Our Like It or Not segment is brought to you by Sport Clips. Unfinished Business is next. The Press Box Stat of the Week is being brought to you by McArdle's Restaurant in Fairport. Come home to McArdle's. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us here on the Rochester Press Box. Our unfinished business segment is brought to you by the Genesee Brew House, your beer destination since 2012. Visit the gift shop, enjoy a tasting at our pilot brewery, and dine at the pub style restaurant at the Genesee Brew House. Unfinished business, Pat, start us off. Tage Thompson, Buffalo Sabres forward, is having the most amazing season you've ever seen from an NHL player, maybe out of Buffalo. He's second in goals, third in points as we tape this show here today. But what makes this story crazy is what Tage Thompson was supposed to be, became, and then eventually became. He was the key piece of the Ryan O'Reilly deal that sent O'Reilly from Buffalo to St. Louis, you know, where Ryan O'Reilly the next season won the uh, MVP of the Stanley Cup Finals and put a cup over his head, which made Sabres fans really mad. Then Tage Thompson just couldn't put it together in Buffalo. Three head coaches in like four seasons. He had to spend time in Rochester and get things better, and it looked like every piece of that deal was going to be a complete disaster until last season. Tage Thompson came out of nowhere, 38 goals, almost hits the 40 goal mark. And this season, he's doing even better. There is no mathematical analysis that shows why Tage Thompson is doing this. In fact, if you look into the numbers, it shows that he should have regressed halfway through last season. Yet, every time you turn on a Sabres game, Tage Thompson is scoring multiple goals, including last week where he had a four. Four goal first period, finished with five goals and a six point night, his second six point night of the season. I don't know what to make of it because like I said, it doesn't make any sense. But as long as it keeps going, I'm not going to ask any questions and I'm going to enjoy it. All right, the World Cup has got me. I know, I know a lot of you, but Tariq, you like football, Tariq, you like baseball, Tariq, you like basketball. What's one more sport? What happened was they did exactly what I needed in the middle of the afternoon. You're watching these two teams battle it out with superstars, millionaires, wanting to win a cup, one they've never won in their career, tons of trophies, greatest players of all time, crying that they're eliminated. And then what does the camera do? Go to the fans who are crying that their team is out. Go to the country where they are distraught and cannot believe that they do have to wait another three and a half years for the World Cup to come back. They did it. It worked. The two o'clock starts with nothing else to watch in the middle of a week on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They got me just like old school baseball used to do in the playoffs. Smart move. Okay, now I have to find a team. So help me. Let me know what team I should follow. I know a lot of people are going to play Syracuse college soccer. Fine, I'll watch them as well. But they got me. I, I will now surrender. World Cup, you did your job. And now I will follow soccer more often. Here's some of what we knew about Mike Leach. He grew up with a pet raccoon named Bilbo Baggins from The Hobbit. Hated candy corn and fruitcake and hot dogs. He liked thin crust pizza. Believed in aliens, but not Bigfoot. Thought disco was a dark time in our country. Jimmy Buffett was his favorite musician. Talladega Nights his favorite film. He owned a gun, but he kept a Viking axe by his bed. He attended Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, because, as he said, the place is like Disneyland, only without the rides and merchandising. Whatever that means. He didn't play football there. Rugby was his game. That was Mike Leach. Yes, as the usual stuff, college football coach, genius, innovative, great motivator, turned programs at Texas Tech, Washington State, and Mississippi State into winners when they really had no business being that. But he was so quirky. I mean, how many other coaches take the time to expound on the things he liked to talk about? Do you know Sean McNamara's stance on Bigfoot? I remember hearing him interviewed on a national radio show, and he left me with something that I've repeated many times. Leach had a law degree, but he never used it. Asked why he chose coaching over law, he answered, because it's the thing I think about in the shower. When he was totally alone with his thoughts, he was drawing up football plays. So that's what he decided he had to do, degree be damned. Mike Leach died Monday of a heart attack at the age of 61, while in the midst of preparing his football team for a bowl game, doing exactly what he knew he should be doing. He leaves the stage beloved all because he listened to the voice that he heard in the shower. 
That is our unfinished business brought to you by the Genesee Brew House, and that is our show. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Uh, as always, happy holidays yet again. Yeah, he's going to steal my line. <laughs> what line? What else am I supposed to say? Happy holidays. Happy Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Hanukkah. Well, what am I forgetting? See, I forgot one, and now I'm going to get tweeted at angrily. Thanks a lot, Tariq. Festivus for the rest of us. Jeez, Jeez man. Yeah, yeah all that stuff. Hey, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week on the Rochester Press Box. <laughs> <laughs>